Welcome to another episode of The Breakdown. This one's coming pretty fast on the heels of our last one, but things have been moving very fast in the province lately. In particular, there's one issue that's been chewing up a lot of the news cycle, and my next guest has been incredibly busy being a part of that news cycle because she's uniquely qualified to comment on it. If you haven't figured out what I'm talking about already, I'm talking about the release of the UCP's draft curriculum. Uh, so for those of you that have perhaps been living in a hole and have no internet, first of all, I don't know how you're watching or listening to this, but the UCP released their draft curriculum and to call it problematic, uh, is to grossly understate it to a lot of people's perceptions. Now we want to make sure that we're providing the best information that we can. So we are thrilled to welcome back to the show again, Dr. Carla Peck who has more expertise when it comes to dealing with social studies curriculum for kids than anyone that I've quite frankly heard of. So Dr. Peck, thank you so much for joining us again. Hey, it's great to be back. Thanks for having me. Now, the last time we had you on, we were talking about the social studies draft draft, if that's what I can call it. And there were quite a few problems centered around that draft, but there were also quite a few problems based on the authorship. So can you tell me sort of if going back to that moment, what were the first sort of red flags for you? Well, the first red flag was even before those drafty drafts were um, leaked to another news organization in fall 2020 was when the announcement came about who all the different experts were that um, uh, Minister LaGrange hired to provide, you know, be consultants basically um, for the various curricular areas. And it was revealed that Chris Champion was the expert uh, that was hired to provide direction on the social studies curriculum. And um, Chris Champion is a historian. Um, he is not a curriculum expert. He is not an expert in K to 12 education. And uh, in a letter to the editor or an op-ed, whatever you want to call it, that uh, I co-authored with three colleagues from the University of Alberta, two of them from the Department of History and Classics uh, that we was published in the Edmonton Journal, the folks from the Department of History and Classics noted in the, the op-ed that um, Mr. Champion, Dr. Champion, is uh, sort of out of step with contemporary uh, historians work uh, in Canadian history. And so um, part of the reason they mentioned that was because some of his very public views on uh, the inclusion of Indigenous history and perspectives in social studies and history curricula, calling it a fad to include such perspectives, uh, calling and specifically, I think, referring to um, the Kairos Blanket Exercise, which has been a, a classroom activity that um, has been taken up quite a bit in classrooms across the country, which uses literally blankets um, and in, in a large room, classroom or gymnasium or whatnot, um, to help students and teachers understand what it would mean to who sort of lose your territory and lose your um, um, sense of identity and so on. And uh, he, I think he, he was referring to that as a fad at one point. Um, he also has used the term survivor in scare quotes when re referring to residential school survivors. And, you know, there's just no need to do that. These are people who have experienced extreme trauma Trauma that for many has lasted uh, generations, you know, it's intergenerational trauma. And um, if you survive trauma, you are a survivor. So, um, and unfortunately the word survivor uh, does appear in quotation marks in the draft curriculum that was just released to the public last Monday. So, you know, that was the first red flag. Sorry to sort of be long-winded with this first question. That was the first red flag just when uh, it was announced that um, he was going to be the sort of main consultant for the social studies curriculum, just given the background and the perspective that he brought to the subject. Uh, and then when the drafts were, the drafty drafts <laughs> that were, um, were leaked, 
uh, last fall, uh, those views really came through in those documents, you know, saying that children are too young, it's too sad to learn about residential schools, and so we shouldn't include it at all. Um, the kind of content that was included was very um, white Western European history, very Eurocentric, and um, and again, and it was also, and we see this in the current documents, it was also so content heavy that um, it, it was going to require memorization. And in fact, in the preamble to those documents that were released in the fall, they weren't released by government, I should clarify, they were leaked to a news organization. But in the sort of one or two page preamble before you got to the actual curriculum content, if you like, um, memorize it, the importance of memorization was um, mentioned several times. So that clearly outlined what the overall direction of this curriculum was going to be. Never mind the overall direction of, you know, we need to focus on great works, on the works of people, you know, white Western European, the great men of history, so to speak. And I am definitely using scare quotes around that. Um, and you know, and so that's, we see a lot of that in the current document that was actually released by the government last Monday. Now for just for context for, for our, our viewers, because when I, when I, when I first heard the term scare quotes, I, I had to look it up because I'd never, I'd never heard that before and correct me if I'm wrong, but scare quotes are effectively the, the written version of sort of the air quotes. So yeah. when, when we say, survivors that has a very different context than saying survivors much like saying dr chris champion who's a history expert um has a very different context than than saying it the other way so it's uh i think that's a really important thing to point out um because if, if people don't understand just how condescending the use of those those scare quotes are and the the bias that that using them puts on it mm -hmm. uh I think it's easy to miss sort of the the weight of of what those things mean, particularly in the context of of the the, the word and the situations that we're we're talking about. Um, so yeah, that's that's absolutely right. And you, I mean, you would you could almost say they're sort of uh, sarcastically, you know, it's like yeah, survivors. You know, um, if you were to give it, if you were to give scare quotes a tone of voice, that you know, it might be that. So. Um, Yes, that's that's exactly right. Okay, and the, the the UCP got quite a bit of of blowback when the the drafty drafts. I like that term. <laughs> uh, when the drafty drafts were released, um, I think that there was potentially some expectation, if not hope, that they would take some of that public feedback uh, and and perhaps make some changes to the the drafty drafts and the final drafts did you find that any of that happened at all not really okay um there was a lot of public outcry not just from people like me but from indigenous groups and um you know, when those drafty drafts came out that uh, we're gonna have to trademark that or something, that term. Um, I'm gonna get another shirt. Made. <laughs> that's right. Um, don't teach the drafty drafts. Um, uh, yeah, there was a lot of public criticism raised at the time by people who have knowledge about curriculum and history. Um, the Canadian Historical Association put out a letter at that time to wrote directly to Premier Kenny and said like, this, this is not good, you know. Um, so lots of people um, provided advice and input and feedback. And unfortunately um, that it doesn't appear to me that that advice and feedback uh, was given any attention whatsoever in coming up with the, the drafts that we now see. We did finally get to see the, the finished drafts uh, they were released now it's, I guess it's about a week ago, uh, mm -hmm. maybe a week and a half. It, it all has just blurred. So it badly. has indeed. Um, and it has, uh, before I get into sort of the, the, 
ideological, and when I say ideological, that's the wrong word, uh, the logistical problems with the, the curriculum, because I think that there's, there's some very clear flaws with the, the, the curriculum, and I want to talk about those first, but then I think that there's some actual uh, pedag pedagogical, I can, it's been a long day. Uh, pedagogical, it's all right. Thank you. Um, I think there's some, some of those issues with the, the, the curriculum as well. So before we get into that part, though, what was your initial impression when they released the documents? Because I know that when they, they finally put them up, uh, I, I could hear the, the cries of the trees across the province oh. because people were printing that thing off at a rate that I don't think anyone's ever done with a government document before. So what were your sort of initial impressions of it? Yes, I was one of the people that printed it off because I wanted to mark it up. Um, well, uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, it looked uh, quite familiar to those early, early drafts that were leaked, that weren't officially released by, by government. Um, in terms of the overall direction and um, slant, I guess that you could say uh, the curriculum was taking, and that overall direction is heavy, heavy in content, focused on memorization. Um, and although it doesn't necessarily say memorization in this draft document that was released uh, a week ago Monday, uh, what we have not seen yet is what's commonly referred to as the front matter of a curriculum. The front matter of the curriculum, it's, it's basically an introduction which is a much better term. So it's an introduction to a curriculum that explains this is what this curriculum is about. This is what social studies is about. This is the, these are the goals that we're aiming towards so that at the end of grade 12, this is what a student should know and be able to do by the, you know, after they've done all these years of social studies. And every subject matter usually has such an introduction because every subject matter has its own goals and unique perspectives and that sort of thing. We haven't seen that yet. I did, there's a link to it on um, the website where you can find the curriculum, but it just says, you know, um, come back soon sort of thing, we're working on it. Um, so that's gonna be very interesting to see, do, are, do they make explicit reference to memorization in that introduction? Um, my, my guess is that they won't because they know that won't be popular, but they'll use terms that are similar to that, such as, and these are terms that we have already heard Minister LaGrange and others use, core knowledge, right? That having a solid knowledge base and this sort of thing. Um, so, so I'm waiting to see that document, but when you look at the curriculum, that's exactly what you see. You see this idea of what is called, what they are considered, they being whoever has written this, um, what they consider to be core knowledge. And there is a lot of it. And um, it's so dense that if I was still in the elementary classroom, there is no way I'd be able to go into depth with any of it because I would just have to be teaching one thing, moving on to the next one, moving on to the next one, moving on to the next one, because there's just so much of it. And I mean, there's so many things that we could talk about. So what is this core knowledge that they have decided is important for every Albertan to know? Well, it comes out of sort of a classics approach to, um, to uh, history, and it focuses a lot on uh, white Western European history, on the great men of history. And um, there are a few women noted here and there, but not a lot. Um, and I do mean a few, like I think in the early early grade, like say K to two, there's only one or two women mentioned and there's a few more, you know, as you get up into the grades three, four, five, six, but uh, by and large, it's sort of the great white man history of the world. Now, is, is there some content um, from other regions of the world um, like um, uh, China and uh, they look at um, some Muslim history, Islam, that sort of thing. Yes, 
but it's all sort of presented anything that is would be classified as non-white, non-European is presented, you know, sort of compared to that white European Western knowledge. And so white European Western knowledge is presented as the norm or the standard that this is, you know, sort of the best knowledge. And here's some other knowledge that, yeah, okay, we're going to let you learn, but it's always positioned in comparison to what is presented as the norm. And what that does is it, it marginalizes that knowledge. It says it's not as important or not as valuable as what is being presented as most valuable. Um, and it alienates a lot of students who do not see themselves in the curriculum and do not see themselves, um, see that knowledge given as much value or prominence. So, yeah, I mean, there's just all kinds of issues, you layer on top of that, the fact that what is included in the, in the elementary social studies is, is so far away from being developmentally appropriate, it's almost laughable if it, if it wasn't so serious. Um, and I, I don't know if you want to talk about that in some more depth or not, but because I know yeah, I'm yeah. sort of going on, but um, maybe I'll just stop there and let you ask the next question or take us <laughs> where you want to go. <laughs> Well, to, to start with, there were, and I, I do very much want to get into the, the, the appropriateness of the content because that was one of the arguments that was used to remove a lot of the, the content surrounding First Nations issues, particularly the okay. residential schools, the argument that it wasn't age appropriate. So okay. I think having a conversation about whether this current content is age appropriate is, is definitely valuable. But um, with the rollout of the, the curriculum, there were some immediate challenges. Now, I think it's important to clarify that what we're talking about tonight is just the social studies curriculum. Right. Um, because there has been some uh, manipulation of perceptions, I'll say, uh, in regards to what it is that people are criticizing. So, for example, I know that the, the, the language arts curriculum uh, did receive some positive uh, reviews. Um, I think that there's probably a conversation to be had in regards to what parts of the curriculum were worked on by what people. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the, the normal curriculum design, can you give us a little bit of perspective for how that would work, how many people would be involved in it, what departments would be involved in it, that kind of stuff? In sort of a usual approach yeah any usual yeah. So, so not in backwards world that we're in <laughs> right the bizarre world we're living in so yes yeah, so in um in alberta alberta is actually in my experience one of the most highly consultative um provinces when it comes to curriculum dot um design and development not the last couple of years but previous Previously, and I don't just mean with the previous government, I mean, going back in time, Alberta has a very strong record of uh, doing wide consultation, not only with teachers, but with parents, community groups, even business, right, could say, well, these are the kinds of things that we think are important for the kinds of employees we want to hire and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and so, uh, I mean, Alberta's most the most recent experience was under the progressive conservatives. And this would be what I would think is a fairly typical approach that um, uh, Alberta has taken uh, is that under the progressive conservatives, they had a program called um, inspiring education and they, and Alberta education as a ministry went out into the public, into communities across Alberta, North, South, East, West, and invited basically anyone who wanted to have input to come to the table and say, what kind of students do we want? What kind of citizens do we want at the end of their high school? Uh, what do we think is important for students to learn? What do we think is important for students to be able to do? And, you know, and what are the kinds of qualities we, wanna, we want to ensure that students uh, have when they graduate high school? And they had, they like went to big hotel banquet rooms or conference rooms and had big round tables where, you know, there'd be six or eight people at a table and, and the whole room would be full and, you know, it might be 
two hour long session and there would be people from Alberta education kind of leading conversations or brainstorming sessions or whatever at all of these tables. And then Alberta education would collect all of that information and then take it to the next step, you know, and they did this over and over again, where they would sort of take the information, refine it, condense it, see what people said that they was in common, what was unique, that sort of thing. And then eventually came up with a plan to say, okay, this is what our sort of purpose of K to 12 education is going to be after doing all of this consultation and really trying to hear from as many Albertans as possible. Um, that sort of continued on for a while. And I don't think the PCs got too much into actual curriculum development, although they did a lot of work on developing competencies and the competencies stuff would have come out of a lot of conversations with Albertans, but it also came out of sort of international trends in education, right? That talking about not just knowledge, not just skills, but what are competencies, which are sort of, you know, competencies might be a whole array of skills that people would have, right? That you would then take into the workplace or into society and so on. Competencies like uh, understanding multiple perspectives, global perspectives, or uh, even managing information. We have such a glut of information in our life right now. So how do you actually deal with all of that and assess it and keep track of it all and that sort of thing. So that's what they meant by competencies. Uh, so they did develop those, they developed a, guide, a guiding framework for curriculum development to sort of set the general guidelines for how curriculum development would proceed in the province, again, taking all of that information from all of those conversations they had. In addition, before any curriculum was even started, you know, the writing process was even started, people at Alberta Education civil servants, people who've been there forever, you know, um, people who might be seconded teachers who'd go and work there for a couple of years, what have you, they would um, do a very in-depth uh, literature review. And what I mean by that is they would dig into the research literature, whether it was for social studies or science or math or what have you. And there would be, I suspect there would be several people working in one area and so they would dig into and see what has been published by researchers working at universities, working in teacher education, historians, you name it, about how kids learn in the subject areas. And they would then take that information to say, okay, to set the goals, right, for what we're going to do in social studies. We'll just stick with social studies since that's my area. Um, and then from there, they would put together teams of curriculum writers. And under the uh, previous government, those teams were massive. I have never seen teams that big. Um, the social studies curriculum writing group had 50 to 60 people on it. That is not typical in other provinces. In British Columbia, you might get a dozen people. Um, in New Brunswick, you might get five or six people, mostly teachers, maybe a university there, person there to be sort of advisor, expert kind of thing. Um, so to have this number of people and like 90% of those people, the 50 or 60 people were teachers and they were nominated by their principal or whatever, you know, to, to be able to be part of it. They had to demonstrate some competence in the area. Uh, if they were a math person, it was unlikely they would be able to work on the social studies one, for example. Um, and so then the curriculum writing teams would work and they met, um, often they met monthly. They would come together as big groups of 50 or 60 in every subject area. And so we're talking like 300 to 350 people at a time, right? And they would um, talk about goals, about what were, you know, what are our goals for the social studies curriculum? And they'd use all that other documentation and the literature and all that stuff to shape that. And they, they would have presentations from different groups, um, community groups uh, who would say, you know, we think this is really important for students to learn in schools. And so all of that stuff would be taken into consideration when shaping the ultimate learning goals and learning outcomes that would be developed, uh, basically developing the content. And they weren't focused on developing content like we see in these drafts, which is just lists of information. 
they were actually focused on developing learning outcomes. So statements that um, sort of go like this, uh, by the end of grade three, students will be able to, and then you would finish that sentence. So it would be something sort of observable that you could see students do and that a teacher could sort of measure and assess over time. And you, of course, you need content to do it. The stuff, you know, the facts, the, the concepts, the ideas, you need all of that stuff for students to be able to do X, Y, or Z. You can't, uh, you can't do it without content. But it was, it was really focused on developing students' learning and thinking and so on. Um, the next step was when the curriculum writing groups got some drafts ready. The group that I was actually on, and we should be clear about that, I was participating in the previous government's curriculum development process. I was on a group called the Edu Teacher and Educator Focus Group. And we did not write curriculum. This was as big a group, 50 or 60 people. And again, 90% were teachers. There were a couple people like me. There were um, a, maybe one or two people from the ATA. Um, there might have been a historian, you know, but it was 90% teachers. And our job was to look at the work that the curriculum writing groups had done and review it and provide feedback. And we would go and we'd spend a day, we'd look at all the documents, we would say, this looks really clear, or this looks really vague, like there's no way anyone's going to understand what this means. And we'd, we'd work together in small groups and provide that feedback, and then, which would then be taken back to the curriculum writing groups for them to work with it and refine. And, and, and that was a process that kept going around and around and around. We kept doing that over time. And then uh, after the election, those groups were just completely disbanded. Uh, and I don't even think we got an email. It was just, everything just stopped. So it would be, to paraphrase, it would be, be safe to say that it was considerably more work than one professor uh, putting together this uh, a, a document over the course of effectively a year. Oh, listen, it... Um... It would be a lot easier for two or three teachers and maybe a curriculum expert or whatever to go into a room and just sit down and write a document, right? I mean, it's not easy work, but you could do it because there's only a few voices at the table, mm -hmm. right? And you, and you just sort of plug away at it. It's a lot harder to try and figure out what 50 or 60 different perspectives and voices uh, want you know, to, to put in the curriculum document. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, this was, it was not easy to take that approach, but it, it was a commitment to consultation and to having diverse voices at the table. Um, that was lived out through the approach of having such large groups work together. It certainly seems like the, the message that's being sent by, by almost exclusively utilizing Dr. Champion uh, is that that consultation piece is not a priority for, for, for the social studies curriculum at the, at the very least. Um, yeah. And, you know, we don't actually know who wrote the drafts that we saw released on Monday. Well, we know who released, who wrote the drafty drafts, or we think we know, um, because of references that are very similar to work that Ms. Dr. Champion has published in the past. Um, but, you know, how do I say this? We don't know for sure because there's no name on it. Yeah. But let's just say they look very similar. As always, if you appreciate the kind of content that we're trying to produce here at The Breakdown, please consider signing up as a monthly supporter at our Patreon site at www.patreon.com slash thebreakdownab. And if you're listening to the audio version of our podcast, please consider leaving us a review and a rating. And don't forget to like and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all at at thebreakdownab. Thank you for your attention.